This is uh, a lecture about the LA School. Uh, the reading for this week uh, is by Mike Davis, who is a journalist who has written very provocatively about many different topics. He is most famous for his book on Los Angeles, uh, published in 1992. You'll notice that's 20 years ago. But uh, two things, it's remarkable to the extent that the things he pointed out in terms of surveillance and class uh, distinction and architecture, <laughs> architecture as a fortress or a jail um, is remarkably forward-looking, but at the same time, from a technological point of view, uh, you, one imagines uh, what he would have to say now about drones and um, all the surveillance techniques that are available for tracking people. Um, undergirding this whole thing, it was bad in 92, but it's gotten worse. You may have noticed the campaign for the 1% uh, the uh, versus the 99%, the Occupy Wall Street thing. Um, this is increasingly a structural condition under which architecture is executed. And so um, we're going to take a quick look at this very recent video that uh, does an excellent job of doing a, a data visualization of American attitudes towards class and wealth. Um, this first bar is what Americans currently think the income distribution is. Uh, if this is all the wealth in the United States, uh, $54 trillion, who has it? How is it distributed? Um, you'll notice that Americans think that the top 60% uh, of Americans um, uh, the top 20% of Americans have 60% of the wealth, and the bottom 20% of Americans have like 2% of the wealth. And this is what Americans think it should be. It should be more equally distributed. It should be like this. The wealthiest people should be wealthy, um, but not that wealthy. This turns out to be what it actually is. The bottom 40% between the two, two groups um, share about 2% of the wealth. The top 1% uh, share about the same amount of wealth that most Americans think the top 20% should share. So that's why um, Mitch had to abandon the trickle-down argument. There is no trickle-down. It is trickle-up. The progress, the economic progress in the United States of the last three decades has disproportionately gone to the top, the wealthiest 1% of Americans. And as this graphic um, continues, it, it illustrates that with vivid drama. Uh, it's kind of like the population chart that I showed you. It really is such a fundamental structural situation that it changes everything. This is all the money, all the wealth available in the United States. And, it's in, and we're going to just throw those dollars uh, and distribute it across the board. Um, this is pure socialism. Everybody, no matter what your achievement level, everyone gets the same amount of money. Not good. No one wants that. No one living today wants anything to do with that. This is uh, the ideal distribution that Americans, when they were polled, said, yeah, this would be OK. The poverty line is right here. Um, and this, you know, the middle class and the rich and the very wealthy. The very wealthy, well, you know, we need, they're the job creators, right? This is, these are the people who innovate and they should be rewarded for their innovation. And so Americans feel strongly that they should be rewarded. Um, and so the next thing, so this is the, 92% of Americans chose this distribution. And here's what Americans think the actual distribution is. They say, hey, this is really unfair. The wealthy, who should be rewarded, you know, they're kind of over-rewarded. This is a little ridiculous. This is a little over the top. This is kind of destructive to our middle-class values of, you know, the myth of the United States is that we are a nation of middle-class citizens. And we all want to live in good houses, and we want better things for our children than we had, and we want to drive and all that kind of stuff. Here's the actual distribution. Um, 
The poverty line is actually here. 15% of Americans live below the poverty line. The middle class is not here uh, where we think it should be. It's not here where we think it is. It's here. And there's this weird thing on this end. And this is where they're going to focus. Just to fit it on the graph, they've got to cut it uh, so it comes into the shot. And then that wealthiest 1%, You've got to take that stack and restack it over here. This is, uh, this is the wealthiest 1%. They control something like what they're about to tell us. Um, they control a great deal of wealth, 40% of the wealth. 40% of the wealth of the nation is held in the wealthiest 1% hands. Uh, yes, they should be rewarded. But um, what's that doing to the vast majority? 80% of the population shares 7% of the wealth. 80% of the population shares 70%, um, 7% of the wealth. So it's a very strange aberration, a very strange distortion of what the American dream has always been. Uh, in terms of its values, Americans, no matter where we fall on this, we think of ourselves as being middle class. When asked, we say, are you part of the, the poor, the very wealthy? Are you rich? Are you poor? Are you working class? Or are you middle class? Ninety-something percent of Americans quite confidently say, oh, I'm middle class. And by middle class, uh, we think of ourselves as being, uh, no matter where we actually are, we think of ourselves as being part of this big group. Um, but the, and here's, here's where you actually see the reality. Um, and this is a very strange um, situation. When they actually show it um, like this. Uh, the, there's an interesting thing uh, culturally. This is the situation, but we don't think of this being the situation. Culturally, we think of ourselves as not just being middle class. Even if we're poor, we think of ourselves as not being poor. We think of ourselves as being pre-rich. How could anyone argue successfully that the wealthiest 1% shouldn't pay more taxes. If this is the situation, isn't that a recipe for being uh, voted out of office? I'm against the wealthiest 1% paying more in taxes. I think the wealthiest 1% should continue to get richer. I think the wealthiest 1% shouldn't control 40% of, of the wealth. They should control 50%. That's what I think and I'm going to vote for any elected official who's going to support the wealthiest 1% having control of 50% of the, the US wealth. How could that win elections? It wins elections every day. That explains a lot. That's why we have the sequester thing, is to fight against the reason this country has been put at great peril, the reason this country's recession is going to uh, uh, potentially drop back down, the job growth is going to stop, is because the Republican-controlled House of Representatives could not tolerate raising the taxes on the wealthiest 1%. They will be reelected by their home states by supporting the increasing <coughs> accumulation of wealth in the, in the hands of the 1%. Who are these voters? They are from the poorest <coughs> counties in the United States. The poorest counties in the United States are voting in favor of the further accumulation of wealth. Why is that? Here's why. We in the United States are optimistic about the future. We know that we have the, the best system in the world. And by the way, we do. We know that things are going to be better for our children than they were for us. We know all of these things. 
Uh, and how do we know that? We know that's true by not knowing this is true. In order for us to know that things are going to get better for our children, we have to not know that this is the actual reality. We have to think that it's like this. And that's the only way this whole thing works. And it's not a completely bad thing to be optimistic about the future. I'm not poor. I am not yet rich. I'm about to be rich. And uh, I am already thinking, culturally, I'm there. I have the values and I have the aspirations uh, of the wealthiest 1%. I share with them the same middle class values. That is what unifies our country. That is actually one of the great strengths of our culture and our country. And that is why we have the voting patterns that we do. That is why a vast majority of the poorest people in the country vote against their own personal interests. Because the ideals of the United States, the ideals of democracy and progress and economic development and growth are so powerful that even when you do tell me that this is the real situation, I don't care. Don't, I don't care. I still believe in my heart that the best way to move forward is to reward hard work. The people who have this wealth, they earned every penny of it. And when I join their ranks any day now, whether I win the lottery or uh, I get my, finally I get a, a, a break, don't you dare try to tax me more than other people. So this is the unifying cultural values. We in the United States, in any other country, this would trigger class warfare. But we in the United States are unified by this cultural ideal. And part of that is our architecture. But in the context of this architecture, we have, uh, in the context of this uh, cultural situation, we have an architectural situation that uh, looks something like this. Um, and we saw it in um, China. This is uh, housing in China. Um, What the thing that will be in the reading, and part of this is to uh, unify the reading and the lecture. Um, the basis of the reading, and we looked at Dubai, we looked at a lot of this. <clears throat> but uh, the basis of the reading is that uh, in, in the context of these cultural aspirations to do better, we uh, take for granted the strategies of uh, segregation. Um, after a long period of expansion in the United States after World War II, uh, in which there was a rising middle class, it was a legitimate redistribution of wealth in favor of a larger majority of people, um, we still have crime and we still have segregation. And so we have gated communities, often themed with architectural themes. Um, and we justify all kinds of strange aberrations. These are the ghost cities. Are these the photos you guys found on ghost cities? So you've seen a lot of this. Um, but the thing that will come clear in the reading is that uh, housing situations in gated communities are justified because uh, the, of this increasing uh, disparity in wealth. Um, the situation that Mike Davis writes about in Los Angeles has gone from being just a situation in Los Angeles to being uh, spread elsewhere. It used to be that Los Angeles was the weird case that wasn't like New York or Chicago or Boston or Philadelphia. It was this weird poly Nuclear. There are many. Instead of one center like Boston has the hub, it has many different centers. And why does it have many different centers? Partly because of the transportation situation. It favors these polynucleated things. Uh, Rem Kohlhaas wrote about junk space, where you go from one luxury enclave to your uh, office enclave downtown and back home again, and in between you pass through junk space. This is what's left over uh, of the landscape. Um, that is not architecturalized. Um, this has increasingly 
Los Angeles has gone from being the exception to being a model uh, that has uh, not just diffused from Los Angeles, but emerged under its own logic and forces in cities all over the world. And so part of this is to have enclaves um, of privilege separated from each other. And so security becomes a fundamental consideration of architecture. And that's what the LA school is about. And that's kind of what uh, Mike Davis chapter is about.